we're going to get you to look at drugs to slow aging. What kind of person is it who actually tries to avoid colon cancer? It's a normal person, but what kind of person is it who tries to live longer? There's actually very good evidence that we could stop a lot of the suffering that's associated with aging. I had grandparents who were really suffering the effects of aging. For me, it was my mum. I read a page on a disease that my grandmother had had. On that holiday, I realised my mum that my mum had it. As I started to research further and further, there suddenly became this realisation, oh, it's just ageing. I think aesthetics is like a tiny little fish swimming along, just about to be eaten by a giant shark. That's what I think is going to happen in the next 10 years in the field of aesthetics and longevity. A lot of us are going to move slowly towards something that is a thousand times bigger than medical aesthetics. We'll still keep doing aesthetics, but it'll be a small part of what we do every single day. Aesthetics is changing. Longevity is the bigger future. If you want to be part of this, click on the link in the description of this video and sign up to the waiting list. This is a very important and a very exciting day for me. Today, I'm joined by a really special guest, and is bringing together lots of things that I think are really important personally to me in my life, but also to all the healthcare professionals who listen to me on my channels. I think something really big is gonna happen in the next 10 years, and I would love many of you to be part of it. And today is essentially day one of bringing it into the core of my business, and I'm excited to bring many of you along with me on the journey. I'm joined today with Dr. Nicola Conlon, who is a scientist, who is interested in longevity. And I've been following her for a long time and all the different interviews she does on YouTube. I've learned an awful lot from her already, but I would love her to explain to you guys more from her perspective about many of the interesting and exciting things that are happening in longevity so that you can play a role in this exciting future that we have ahead of us in this sector. So welcome, Dr. Nicola. Hello. Can I call you Nicola? You can you call me Nicola. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely fine. So, um, Nicola, your background is, I know you did your PhD in bioavailability, and then you went into drug development. Yeah. And that led you down the path of becoming an expert in longevity. And that's really cellular aging from your perspective. So what is it that makes people um, grow old, um, what we can do to slow it down, and all the implications around that? It's an, it's an amazing field. I'm super excited to have you here. And um, is there anything else people should know about you from the start before we dive in? No, I think that's a, that's a pretty good introduction. Yeah, I am a scientist specializing in what it is that's actually causing us to age on the inside. Mm -hmm. Because quite often when we think about aging, we always think about the outside, but ultimately everything's really happening on the inside. So what I've sort of become an expert in is what's going on inside our cells which are the, the units that are making up everything that makes up our entire body. So what's happening to cause aging in our cells? Mm -hmm. So from the perspective of a lot of people in my audience who are aesthetic practitioners, mm -hmm. um, they will be used to people reporting on what they see. And what I love about this sector is it pulls it all together because you're gonna learn on this podcast and the other content that we create exactly what's happening on a cellular level that actually causes some of the stuff you can see. Um, and it's going to make a lot of what we do really make a lot more sense as to why people want to change it, but also how you can actually change it at a much deeper level, which is going to be a, a tremendously exciting thing to learn about if you haven't already learned about it. And if you think you already know about it, pay attention, because every time I listen to Nicola, there's always something else that um, goes in a bit deeper. So I think, I, I think what we should start with is just talking a little bit about the, the sort of science of aging um, and really why 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 we are both in this position. I'd like to hear a little bit about your story in your own words. I know I've heard some of it before, but about what got you into longevity. And then I will explain a little bit about why I'm so excited by it. Yeah, absolutely. So initially it wasn't age and research that I was interested in. Um, as you said, I did my PhD, which was all about bioavailability. So how um, do nutrients, supplements, drugs, how when you take them orally, are they absorbed in the gut and how do they get around your body and into the cells um, where they perform their function? So that's kind of what my initial expertise was in. Um, I worked in, in academic labs at a university. Um, I soon realized that that probably wasn't for me because working in academia, you become very, very focused on one very particular thing. Um, and I quite often felt like a lot of science gets sort of locked in labs and never makes it out to help people or, you know, to the general public. Um, so 
being a bit naive at the time, <laughs> um, to say the least, I thought, well, how how can I, you know, do a job that will um, make this research that I'm doing actually benefit people? So I decided to go and work in drug development. So I went to work in the drugs industry, um, initially in, in cancer drugs. Um, so my role was looking at, at early stage drug development. How can we look at the targets that we're going to affect in the body, develop drugs, make sure those drugs are bioavailable, and then get them off into clinical trials to be tested um, so I was like great you know I finally feel like I'm translating this science into something useful um, I did that for a while and um, then one day my boss came to me and he said um, Nicola um, we're gonna move you on to a new project uh, which for me at the time I was pretty disappointed by because I was working on some really forward-thinking anti-cancer therapies and that was like a really cool area to be involved in and he said we're gonna get you to look at drugs to slow aging and I was like okay this is odd like is that a thing um, because this is like a decade ago um, you can slow aging with drugs this sounds you know like a bit like mickey mouse science is it real like um he said no that's it's going to be your job i want for the next year you're going to basically go um to lots of different labs lots of different conferences meet lots of different scientists and you are going to look at this um sort of longevity field that is emerging and you're going to look at all the different science and basically come back and say where should we be targeting um, is there something in this? Is it real? Can we really slow age in? Um, and then we're going to look at starting projects within this company. So that is exactly what I did. I had this amazing opportunity to, to basically travel travel all over the world, meeting all the key eminent scientists in this field, uh, learning everything that they were teaching, that they were discovering, all these latest advancements, and then coming back and going, okay, these are the top five things that I think have 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 legs and you know have, have some real credibility behind them and something we can target. Let's start projects in them. So that's what we did. So I ran those projects in that company. Um, but then very soon I was getting a bit frustrated and there were two things that really frustrated me. The first was that I'd gone into the world of drugs <laughs> um, thinking that we could get this science and we could get it out to help people. But the reality is that drug development takes a very, very long time. You're looking on average about 10 years minimum um, to get a drug to market. So all of this cool stuff we were working on wasn't going to get to benefit anyone anytime soon. The second thing that was really frustrating was that often we would send um, hundreds of different molecules to our labs to be screened. So basically to see if they had the effect that we wanted them to have. And quite often um, when we received the list back, we, you know, we'd get a list saying these ones work really well at the top. Uh, these ones work half as well. These ones don't work at all. Quite often the ones that worked really, really well were things that were plant molecules or naturally derived molecules and not what a drugs company is interested in looking for because unfortunately if it's a known molecule they find it very difficult to patent and own them and if they can't patent and own them they will not invest the hundreds of millions into the development that they need. So. I was sort of there in this situation being like, okay, we've got this amazing science that shows that maybe you really can slow the aging process, which is going to help people. Uh, we've got these molecules that work really, really well, um, but we're not going to even look at them because they can't patent them. And then we're going to spend 10 years and hundreds of millions um, invested into developing something that works half as well. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this, you know, commercially, it makes sense. Ethically, doesn't make sense and there are things that we could be doing now in the meantime. So I left the world of drug development in 2017 and I founded my company which is Nichido Laboratories where our mission is how can we take all of those natural molecules, those things that drugs companies aren't really interested in but have good efficacy and, and basically translate them into products that people can be using now. So it's a way of getting that science out of the labs and getting it into the hands of people so that they can actually take control of the way that they're aging mm -hmm. i love that so i'm picking up this theme in you of it's no good having a boss who's happy with you or earning a lot of money or all the things that you could say are quite personal you actually want something out there in the world that's making a difference 
um, which I which I really resonate with, and I think a lot of the best practitioners who I train have something similar, which is it's no good erasing a wrinkle, for example. You actually want the person that you want their life to be better. Yeah. So it's that the the difference between a lot of academics and what it turns out you are, which is somewhere in between. You've got the mm-hmm. academic side, but you actually you're trying to get something in, into the world that makes an, an impact. Um, I think it's that's clearly been leading you yeah. all the way. It's it's all about you know. As scientists, you know, academic scientists particularly, or people at early stage research, the things that we are doing in the labs and the things that we're discovering is often the first time that that piece of information or that discovery has happened. So it's brand new. And what's so frustrating is how long it then takes to get that incredible science that could be helping people into an actual form or into you know common knowledge so that people um, can benefit from it. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of scientists are very good at doing all the discoveries and the, the experiments, but are not very good at actually then translating it into something that, that can benefit people or certainly it takes a long time and for me the you know the real frustration was also personal because um, I could you know I had grandparents who um, were really suffering the effects of aging and uh, you know I had I had my, my granddad he un- unfortunately um, died of cancer prostate cancer it's an age-related condition in, in men um, my grandma then had a stroke she was in a wheelchair um, you know she had cognitive decline ended up living in a care home for 10 years and that was like for me knowing that it didn't have to be like that if people could have access to some of this research that's coming out now that there is a different way um, for me it was that mission of let's how do we get this science out there because you know it's about democratizing science I always say it's about making it available so people can firstly access it but secondly understand it because sometimes science can be quite scary and people kind of go oh it's science I don't, you know I, I'm not a scientist I don't understand um, but if it's explained in the right way and people can understand it then actually knowledge is power um, and they can use that to, to basically help their health essentially Mm -hmm. so that's that's super powerful I can imagine you're sitting in these pharmaceutical companies and people are telling you all the stuff that works and at home you've got grandparents who are unwell and you're thinking so there's a real sense of tension there around around why I can imagine why you'd want to actually use that because um, I think some people just built that way especially if you I often say with practitioners who I train there's that six-year-old part of you who wants to just help people yeah. delight people put the plaster on the knee and you <laughs> feel like oh I did something important and so you're sitting on all this this body of knowledge that you know could help your grandparents and they can't access it um, I think that's I, I can c- completely imagine why that would drive you in a, in a different direction and it's 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 kind of related a little bit to my story which which why I'm making this much more central to what I'm doing so I've been in medical aesthetics now 15 years still a practicing GP and I never let go of that most people in my position would have let go of it a long time ago and I I think I've known subconsciously why I shouldn't let go of it which is because of this side of things and um, and where I think this whole sector because currently there is a there is an opportunity for medical people to lead the way on this because it's currently not considered a disease I don't think I think Australia maybe recognized aging as a disease or made some movements towards it but in most countries aging is not considered a disease which does mean if you are medical there's this kind of gray area where if you can find stuff that works like you're in a good position to actually start doing things in a way that is slightly different to when it I think when it eventually does get categorized as a disease whereas it might go into the hands of hospitals and I'm not sure we'll see but it's um it's an exciting time my 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 personal story that that's made me particularly passionate about this is similar to you I've had people impacted mm. by diseases and for me it was my mum and I am um, I find it hard to talk about still but anyway she she was it, I brought with me my first textbook that I bought when I was a medical student because I took that on holiday with me um, before I started medical school mm. and I was reading about stuff and I, I didn't I didn't know my mum was sick at that time but I read a I read some a page on a disease that my grandmother had had and and <clears throat> on that on that holiday I realized my mom, that my mum had it sorry <laughs> it's um <clears throat> but she didn't know and she wasn't diagnosed for another year 
but that was that's the trauma in in my family because I knew how bad it was going to be because I'd lived with my gran as she got older and got worse and it was something that um, has kind of haunted our family ever since and it's there's an element of genetics it's not the most genetic thing um, and I kind of tried to block it out for a long time I don't think I really fully dealt with it uh, up until I started having I had children myself and then there was a point where I suddenly it's my mom deteriorated really fast all of a sudden end up in hospital I thought she was going to die she managed to go another five more years but she um, but but it I suddenly realized that there was a vulnerability in my fa like I actually felt the vulnerability because I hadn't felt it before um, when I was when I was reading about it like in textbooks or when I was seeing other patients I thought oh, that's the kind of thing that happens to other people yeah. and I and suddenly it was like I felt vulnerable because I had kids for the first time myself and I suddenly started thinking what if this happens to me mm. and that what if question just opened up this whole world of like shit like life life really is tough sometimes for people and if you get something like this um you're really scuppered like it's yeah. really bad and so that sent me off on a whole health anxiety loop that lasted about I don't know four to four to six months of just really losing losing my mind over the what if question which is a useful idea I always use it with patients now it's a really bad question mm -hmm. <laughs> what if you have something bad is always what you might mm -hmm. so anyway not a good question I don't recommend anyone asks that question of themselves but um, around about that time I, I, I realized I had to confront this issue which is I need to have some control over s try and get some control and when I, f when I first started researching kind of what causes Parkinson's and what are the, what are the triggers, you, you end up with these like really th tiny little theoretical things that might help like, oh, maybe it's Helicobacter pylori and I, you know, I got Helicobacter pylori test and it was negative and then what? I don't even know if my mom had that. Um, you know, there's like one thing after the next that seemed really tiny. And then as I started to research further and further, it, it suddenly became a lot like some of the talks I've heard you gave in the past, which we're going to cover, there suddenly became this realization, oh, it's, it's just aging. Like mm -hmm. I can I can actually make a really big impact on the probability or at least delay it by just focusing on what would actually make me, make a body younger and, and healthier. Um, and that was, that was a sudden like, oh, there is something. And you don't have to look for these niche papers on potential triggers or whether it's pesticides or whatever else. Yeah. And you can just more globally take control, which, which is, I think, a really positive and exciting method message for anyone who has something in the family that that makes them vulnerable to these sorts of things um, and the a big part of my mom's suffering was also unfortunately that she got osteoporosis with it as well and um, in fact a lot of my life I tried to move things forward for her so we got married a bit sooner mm -hmm. and um, had babies a little bit sooner which I t which was a great decision because she got to know her grandchildren um, but but the, this is the other thing is there's I started to think why would she have such bad osteoporosis and Parkinson's disease mm. and what do I like what's going on there and that also seemed confusing and I'm kind of looking at genetic factors and there's nothing specific that stood out but I, I wonder if there's something in these hallmarks of aging that we'll cover that might might have kind of be linked somehow like it's um, and it might just be that for whatever reason she genetically aged differently yeah. um, I don't know but it's uh, it's super for me. It's super exciting that there is something that can be done, and that you can actually significantly delay all of these potential di diseases. And then, uh, and and it's actually relatively easy, and it's good for you now. And I think that's another really important thing that I think it should excite people, which is all of these things we're going to talk about actually make your life better now. Like it's not actually about whether you live two hundred years or not. It's actually that tomorrow is a better day as well. And, uh, and hopefully alongside that, we'll live help, ha happy and healthier lives, even if they don't completely end aging, which we'll touch on as well. But at least it's, it's taking us in the right direction. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, to really hit home on what, what you've said there about aging and, and that, you know, we're constantly told that we do all these things that are bad for our health, you know, if we're drinking or smoking or eating the wrong diet or not exercising as much they're all risk factors for all these diseases that that are very common but actually putting on years is by far the worst thing that you can do for your health mm -hmm. so our age is the biggest risk factor 
for all of the common diseases. And this is when I sort of had this sort of ooh, moment working in drug development in that, you know, we're trying to develop drugs for cancer, we're trying to develop drugs for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for, you know, all these different age-related diseases. Um, but really, the biggest risk factor for all of them is your age. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if age is the biggest risk factor for all of them, then how, why don't we flip it around a little bit and go, well, as you say, is is aging the disease and on all of these different diseases that we classify them as simply symptoms of aging and when you start to look at it like that that's when you know you're a bit like okay well if these are all symptoms of aging the biggest risk factor is aging aging is actually the root cause then why don't we target the root cause and target aging mm -hmm. and this is exactly what this field of longevity research is all about it's about looking if we can ta target the root cause which is aging and therefore have an impact on multiple different diseases in one go that are all affecting our health as we get older yeah because aging is is an exponential thing um you know it's not it's not something where it's it's gradual it actually speeds up the the consequences of aging get worse the older we get um so if you look at common age-related diseases like cancer cardiovascular disease alzheimer's neurological decline what you will see is that the incidence of these diseases kind of just tracks along until you get to about 50 and then it just goes up so cardiovascular disease shoots up cancer risk shoots up and um, alzheimer's certainly if you haven't got it by the time you're 70 the risk after 70 is is through the roof so mm -hmm. you can pretty much guarantee it's on its way i and think you um showed us a graph last time i saw you speak which captures this in one yeah. image which is amazing and it i actually think i remember thinking it's kind of stupid what we've been doing <laughs> because <laughs> because obviously you're plotting all these variables and you can say oh look your cholesterol will mm -hmm. lead to a potential risk factor but there's one factor that completely missed that is way more powerful than all of them and it is this you look at all these diseases they're exponential as you get older yeah and it, it's 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 almost i think a lot of good answers are staring you in the face but you just have to ask the right you have to ask the right question yeah and it's like if you if you actually cured cancer and it didn't exist anymore and if you got cancer it was all treatable and it was all fine i think there's some stat where it would only add about an extra two healthy years of life because mm. We've still got all the cardiovascular problems. We've still got the problems of frailty. We still have the problems of neurological decline. You know, it, and it just shows that you can't just be looking at one disease in isolation because actually aging is is a is a comorbidity of, of multiple different diseases mm. in, you know, not just one thing. Yeah, and it's, it's very, um, it then starts to create a different picture in your mind about what these diseases are because it's we're basically have things playing out in our systems that you can't see until a breaking point mm. and that's when medicine 1.0 will come in and say oh i've discovered the thing that's broken but you haven't you haven't really you've missed this long opportunity where you could have done something to prevent the thing breaking yeah you know i, I was i heard the analogy recently of kind of sensors in your car like my car's probably got 300 different sensors that tell tell me what's going on. And if there's a brake pad worn or whatever, I get an alert and then I get to fix it before the car careers off the motorway. Yeah. But we don't have that for our bodies. So most people wait until something breaks. And there's this tremendous opportunity now to get ahead of that and delay things that, that, that could, you know, you don't know when they're gonna happen, but it's a fantastically different mindset to how most healthcare works, which is you wait until the problem occurs. Um, and that's that's the big exciting thing that I think we're going to lead to. But to get to that point, we have to figure out what actually is aging in the first mm -hmm. place. So I think most people, you think of a you know some implement that you had in your house, and it's it's just a little bit of wear and tear, and things are so there are a few chips showing up, and it's just the same thing but older. Mm -hmm. But aging is actually a much more interesting process than that. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you think about what aging actually is? Yes. So when I get people to think about aging, I always get them to think about evolution because the two things kind of go hand in hand. So if you think about it really, although, you know, for, for ourselves, we might have thought that our life purpose was to be a doctor or a scientist or whatever. Actually, as far as evolution is concerned, it doesn't matter what our job is. All it is concerned about is that we are able to find a partner, reproduce and pass our genes on to the next generation. That is 
all that evolution has designed our bodies to do. And it means, you know, although it sounds very crude, it basically means that our body is just like a shell to protect our DNA, which is the blueprint of life, which is what has to be passed on to keep the germline going, to keep, you know, to keep the human race to exist, basically. And unfortunately, many things as we go throughout life are trying to damage our DNA. So even just the simple process of breathing and being alive, that is continuously trying to damage our DNA. Um, and that doesn't even mention anything like the UV from the sun, um, our exercise, our diet, all of these things continuously try to damage this precious DNA cargo. So it means that our body has had to develop some really sophisticated mechanisms to be able to make sure that it can keep this precious DNA in good health so that we can get to the point of reproduction and pass on our genes. And then as far as our body's concerned, it's fulfilled its purpose and a job done. And this means that we've got all these fancy repair mechanisms in our cells that keep the DNA in good health. But the problem is, is that they actually use a lot of energy. Um, so they're very expensive in terms of how much the resources the body has to put in to try and, and, and keep these repair processes going. So once we kind of get past childbearing age, our body's kind of like, okay, you know, should have done the job now. Um, do we really have all this expensive repair things switched on? Um, and everything starts to get turned down a little bit. So we start to accumulate damage in our bodies, in our cells, and this manifests as a lot of the signs and symptoms that we sort of see as aging on the outside. And this is actually quite a famous um, theory of aging within um, the longevity space. It's called the disposable soma theory of aging which is basically that our soma, our body, is just disposable. <laughs> it's just this protective shell for our DNA. And once the DNA is passed on, it doesn't really matter about the body and it doesn't matter mm. about keeping the body in good health. So, you know, just keeping all that in mind. That's quite a stark image, actually. It's a very stark <laughs> image. It's a scientist. We just tell it how it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but essentially, when you look at evolution, that is that is the... The, you know that that is why we exist and everything in our biology is designed to make us better at reproducing you know finding a partner surviving reproducing and passing those genes on it's like survival of the fittest basically mm -hmm. and that was you know great in the past when we were cavemen and women but all of a sudden within the last couple of hundred years um, our lifestyles have changed a lot we have gone from having a life expectancy that was around age 40 now to doubling that to be in you know in developed countries around age 80. so in a very short space of time we have suddenly started living much longer due to improvements in sanitation healthcare medicines things like that but our biology hasn't had time to catch up so essentially evolution has made our bodies being very good at being young and getting to childbearing age but it hasn't made our bodies good at being old because we never ever lived to be old we were never living this long so in terms of our biology this is new territory we're not designed to live this long and, and even if you did live that long the selective pressure is really just to have children once you've done that like living beyond that there isn't a selective pressure to keep you living. No, Apart absolutely from, I know, not. I think there's something around grandparents being mm -hmm. useful for survival of grandchildren, but beyond that, you're not actually serving a survival purpose for your genes because they're in someone else who's doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. And, you know, if there was anything that helped to make us live longer, well, we were probably going to die of a tooth abscess or in childbirth or something else before that would ever give us some sort of a survival benefit. So evolution basically hasn't kept up. And it just means that the bodies that we are living in and the way our biology is designed is basically helping us be good at being young, but it doesn't really care for us being old and it's not designed to help us live old in good health. Mm. So we're kind of, this is, 
you know, why when we look at a lot of those graphs, like the, the incidence of cancer, cardiovascular disease, things like that, that after childbearing age, that's when you really start to see um, those those graphs really kick up and your risk factors start to go up as a lot of repair mechanisms become overwhelmed. Um, things that were acting to keep us in good health when we were young actually start to backfire and make it harder for us to be old in good health. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is a, a, a main reason um, why uh, this thing of aging kind of exists. And the real problem that it gives us as modern humans is that we have a discrepancy between our lifespan, which is you know just the number of years that we'll live, and our health span, which is the more important term because our health span is the proportion of our lifespan that we will actually live in good health. And again, just going back to thinking about parents and grandparents, you will absolutely understand what being out of your health span means. For my grandparents, that's when they were in a care home and able to look after themselves and able to have quality of life and able to be independent. That is being out of your health span. And unfortunately, if we look at the, the stats at the moment for a, a woman um, in the UK, the average life expectancy is around 64 years. Sorry, the average um, the average lifespan is 83 years, but the health span is only expected to be 64 years. So that's looking at, you know, nearly a quarter of our lives in poor health. That's a huge amount of time to be suffering from multiple chronic diseases mm -hmm. and is definitely not something to be looking forward to. It's, it's a huge, I think if you're young enough to be listening to this and um, not have any health problems. I think it's easy to to forget how basically you don't know yet how awful it is when suddenly your life starts to revolve around a particular disease. Yeah. Now, my dad's type one diabetic, and it's we talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like this con, and that's not even a particularly bad one, I don't think. Um, but it's you start to revolve around the sickness, and that basically shrinks everything. Mm -hmm. And it's it's this is why it's so valuable to just push that back a little bit because it gives in fact I saw some ridiculous stat on like what it would even be worth to the economy to delay by a year yeah. when people get sick it's it's unbelievable basically how expensive it is to get sick um, and uh, so it's super super valuable and this is why I think that this is going to take off is because once everyone clicks that if it's possible what it's worth and how much research it should have I still don't think it gets anywhere near as much as it should have because too many people are reactive. So super exciting, thinking about it that way, that little delay and increase in lifespan is good for everyone. And we'll t talk later, it may be appropriate now actually to talk about whether it's actually a good thing or not to help people live longer. Because um, when I was reading David Sinclair's book, I thought it was really interesting that his 16 year old son basically said it was a really bad thing that he was doing. He effectively disagreed with this idea of helping people live longer. Um, and I've got friends and family who've kind of reacted to this whole idea, not in, not as positively as I have, let's yeah. just put it. <laughs> so um, I'm interested, like, have you come across anything like that in your work while you, when you tell people what you do, where people react negatively to it? Absolutely, yeah. So when I first got into this um, 10 years ago, when I was going around meeting all the scientists and you know learning all about longevity and it was really new to me, uh, you know, I was very excited and I was going to people and um, saying, you know, well, look at this new research and we can we can um, help people to, to not age. And everyone was shocked and everyone was like, why on earth would you want to live longer? Like, you know, this is crazy. And I was like, no, 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 but it's, it's not just about that. It's about not making people live longer, but it's about, you know, making people live healthier. And honestly, people just could not get their heads around it. And then that, that's why it then clicked with me about why this longevity space was quite underground at the time. It was like, um, almost like a secret if you were working as a scientist on longevity. Uh, if you went and put a grant application in and said you were trying to cure aging, you would have been laughed out the room. You know, people had to put applications in for age-related diseases or mm. something something more um, acceptable. Um, but really, it was like, we're not even working on that. We're trying to stop aging. Um, it was a very sort of underground and hush-hush research community. Um, and I think the main reason is, is that because aging is so unpleasant. If you if you talk about aging, 
not many people have a good opinion of it. I mean, if you ask my daughter, she might be like, oh yeah, aging's great because I get old enough and I'm allowed to do more things. But most people are like, oh no, you know, aging, it's decline and I don't want to get older. And when something's in unpleasant, and there's nothing you can do about it. As humans, we just kind of try to say, well, it's inevitable, you know, it's natural. It's a fact of life, you know, grow old gracefully um, and and just sort of put that spin on it. If it's inevitable, we might as well accept it and, um, you know, be at peace with it. And when you challenge that idea and start to say something really far-fetched as far as they're concerned, that is, well, what happens if you didn't have to age that way? Um, it's very difficult for people to get their heads around it because it's just too many steps away from what they believe is possible. And if people don't believe something's possible and they don't understand how it could be possible, most people will naturally just shut down an idea. Um, you know, all the sort of big discoveries and advancements in the world where people have had these cra- ideas that were once crazy, but now are completely accepted as normal, have to go through this process of, you know, being crazy and then being like, okay, maybe this is possible. And then it's obvious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I think one day this will all be obvious, but it's just got to go through that natural process, which we as humans and also the general public, um, have to go through in order to to accept Mm -hmm. something that is going to be a massive massive change from what we have traditionally brought up to accept Mm -hmm. i think there's also there's there's a lot of it's there's the understanding of what's possible and the implications but there's also a philosophical shift needed Mm -hmm. for people to feel comfortable doing it yeah and there's something i've observed with um i I told you earlier about my sister-in-law who had fought tooth and nail for a colonoscopy at an earlier age because she has a um the familial adenomatous polyposis in her colon so she gets Mm -hmm. polyps they have to be removed has a risk of cancer and the nhs initially didn't want to keep doing them and she really fought for it now she's in the system she has them on a regular basis um but just after we talked about that i mentioned about my interest in longevity and um and basically she said she wasn't interested in it and that was really interesting to me because of this disconnect between clearly she's trying her best to stay alive but then she thought this idea of trying to be younger is somehow um not not the same thing and in my mind it is the same thing and that's the philosophical shift Mm. i think which is and it's one of the reasons i think to think of aging as a disease might be crucial because there are a lot of people who wouldn't do it unless there's a that almost being driven by doing it by avoiding something bad rather than trying to get something good because there's i don't know if it's that they see and there's something else that wonder about Brian Johnson because he looks so different where a lot of people feel that that's a different kind of person or it's too self-obsessed or there's something like that around saying, yes, I would like to prolong my life that seems almost too selfish for some people. I don't believe that, but... Yeah, it's certainly, it's the ethics of it, isn't it? I think um, initially when I started talking about longevity, a lot of people automatically assume that it's some sort of quest for, you know, immortality um, and, you know, you're never going to die and um, we're going to upload our brains to the web or whatever. That's sort of how it always used to be perceived. Um, But I think... The way I sort of try to get those type of people to rethink about this is to compare aging to cancer, right? So, you know, not that long ago in in, in history, cancer was something where if you got it, you know, it would be like, oh, well, it's a fact of life. It's natural. There's nothing you can do about it. Sorry, off you go. Suffering's going to come. You're going to die. Bad luck because there was nothing that we thought we could do about it. But now there would be absolute outcry if, you know, somebody had cancer and we just went, oh, well, fact of life, you know, nothing you can do about it, Um, you know, get on with it. Because actually science is showing now that we understand why cancer is happening. We understand that there are things that can be done about it. And there is millions, if not billions, (laughs) invested into research to try and stop and cure cancer. Now, the position we are now in with aging is kind of like where we were with cancer back then. It's at that point now where we're saying, actually, 
there is something we can do about this. There's actually very good evidence that we could stop a lot of the suffering that's associated with aging. So now the question is more like, actually, if there's things you can do about it, then isn't it, isn't it more unethical not to do anything about it? Mm -hmm. And if you now had the option to do something about it, not for, for vanity or for, you know, whatever it may be portrayed as, but for your health, because aging is the biggest risk factor for all of the diseases that cause suffering, isn't it unethical not to do something about it and not to take this research and actually help people with it? Interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. That, that will be the tipping point when the data is so strong that you can no longer ignore it yeah so because it does suddenly change the paradigm right now we're saying well you don't no one needs to live longer you know yeah. because no one can but as soon as you're like well actually you can and people are needlessly dying then it's it's completely <laughs> it's totally changes opposite. it and the other way the other thing the other big argument you always get is oh well we don't need any more people on this planet the mm -hmm. planet's overcrowded and again, you've just got to go back and, and look at like human history and go, well, you know, when penicillin was invented, did somebody say, actually, we better not invent this because we're going to get too many people on the planet? Or when we decided to put proper sanitation systems in place in cities, um, did people go, oh, no, well, why would we want that? We want to keep killing off people so that we don't overcrowd the planet. Mm -hmm. It's like it's this technology is moving which means that yes um, we will be helping people to live longer but all the technology around it is also changing which are also going to put all the support systems in for you know dealing with things that people perceive to be problems such as overpopulation um you know intensive farming practices that are ruining the world so we can't feed the population etc etc it's like you can't look at one thing in isolation um and you can't sort of people are very quick to dismiss things without looking back at history mm -hmm. and saying well actually this is just totally the same as us saying well let's help people with sanitation or help people with modern medicine nobody back then was going well we better not do this because it's gonna you know help people live yeah <laughs> which is yeah and on those same lines there are lots of people who feel basically the world's going to end in like mm -hmm. 12 years time whatever mm -hmm. and um and what I always say to those people is that people, there have always been people like that. Like mm -hmm. since, since history began, there were people predicting the end of the world and somehow humans always come up with a solution. But wouldn't you be more likely to come up with the solution if you thought you were gonna be part of the future as well? Mm. And this is something Brian Johnson said, which I really like, which is I think if you suddenly think, well, maybe I can live 120 years um, or even longer at some point, that changes the types of decisions and the types of projects you're likely to take on. And I think if that became a mainstream thing, we would probably make better decisions. I mean, that's one way that it could play out in our favor because no one wants to ruin their own lives. They're okay with their somewhere down the line in 200 years time, people you know, having to clean up their mess, but they're not okay with having to do it themselves if it's gonna happen yeah, right now. Yeah, and I think interesting to bring up people like Brian Johnson, who is this, this biohacker who's suddenly appeared all over the newspapers and Netflix documentaries and things recently. You know, he is an example of someone who has taken all of the latest science technology in this space to the extreme. Um, and I think it, it has good and bad effects in terms of public opinion. I think good effects in that it gets people talking about it. It gets people like going, okay, so what is all this about longevity? And maybe they'll start paying a little bit more attention to it. But then it also has a, a bad effect in the way that that is an extreme. And you know, it's not that you have to go to that extent to able to be able to implement this into your to your life in mm -hmm. some way. And I think certainly I'm seeing the things that are coming out about biohacking now um, and these extreme characters coming out who are doing all sorts of different things is certainly what I saw back when I was first getting in, into the longevity space, which is where um, anybody that was talking about longevity was was basically talking about the really extreme things like gene therapy and altering our DNA and um, basically, you know, you know, I would sit around dinner tables with these people and the com topic of conversation would be, have you got a, a, a little wristband that shows that you're going to be cryogenically frozen should you suddenly drop down dead and where is your cryogenics policy? 
policy held and <laughs> you know and oh my brother died and his head had to get chopped off and frozen and sent to Switzerland and this was like a completely normal topic of conversation in that <laughs> field but they couldn't quite understand how that was not normal to the average person so I think it's 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 all about everything is always the extremes to begin with because I think it's it's a certain character of person who's willing to be that n equals one that first person to experiment on themselves and try things mm. before it then does naturally roll out to the rest of the population but I think a key bit that I always talk about is that you know this you don't have to go to that extreme but if I'm sat here telling you that you do not need to end up like your parents or your grandparents, would you take the option? Yeah, exactly. I, I, there's something similar I used to say to patients when they would, well, I didn't, I, used, I realized with patients that many of the times they had age, signs of aging that um, they would be in some sort of difficult decision about whether to do something about it. And I knew that if I had a magic wand, they would take the magic wand. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the injections or the yeah. process or the label it would give them. But the actual thing would definitely be a thing they wanted. And this is where I think a lot of these these stories break out in your mind's eye about what, what kind of person is it who actually tries to avoid um, you know, colon cancer. It's a normal person, but what kind of person is it who tries to live longer? Mm. Like they're suddenly, oh, they're, that's different. Um, and I, I think people like Brian Johnson, I, although I am, I'm actually quite a big fan of him, but there is a lot of people when I when I see how he's received, they see they seem to see him a bit more like what you've discussed as a as a kind of freak and extreme, yeah. and that actually he's suffering. A lot of people think his life's not worth living. Have you listened to him? He's loving life. He's living mm -hmm. his best life. Yeah. But everyone who watches it think, oh no, that's just like he's almost like punishing himself by not eating and not or doing the you know the. But it, I don't think that's the case. But it, you have to go on a journey for it to make sense. Yeah. Um, because when you first look at it, it looks so different to your average life that, and this is something I, I've learned in aesthetics as well, which is people almost have an identity challenge. Uh, why aren't you running every morning if someone else is doing it? You have to define that. Well, I'm not doing it because I think it's better to whatever. You know, you should enjoy your food. So that's why I don't think about what I eat. I just eat whatever I like. Mm -hmm. Becomes the defense mechanism against, well, maybe you could do both. You could yeah. enjoy it and eat healthily. Um, and, and that's, I think that's where this, if I would choose a direction that we should go, it should start to feel like nurturing yourself as opposed to depriving yourself. And I, I think what people see in Brian Johnson incorrectly is that he's depriving himself, yeah. but actually he's enjoying himself. He's got his project and you know he's passionate about it and it's his work as well. Yeah. And for people who are milder than that, who don't want to devote their whole lives to it, but want to get some of the benefits, it's all good even here and now. You actually feel better in the short term. So I hope you enjoyed that first introduction into this fascinating topic, a broad introduction touching on just some of the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. If you are interested in this topic, make sure you like and subscribe, follow us on our normal social media channels because there's a lot more coming in the next episode. If you're interested in implementing some of longevity into your practice and learning much more about it, make sure you also click on the link for my new membership because we're gonna be talking a lot about that in there and how to actually use this in your businesses.